On October 31, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door of the Wittenberg Castle in Germany. These 95 statements challenged the status quo and made way for the Protestant Reformation. So I hope that you enjoy this historical episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast as we explore the life and ministry of Martin Luther. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast. I'm your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and if you like the show, I hope that you might take a minute to subscribe, rate, and write a review for the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to it, because it helps to boost the show and make it to where more people can find it. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash methodicalpod, and you can find me on Instagram as well, at Methodical Pod. So be sure to check me out. I want to announce that I have written an Advent book entitled Hope for the Holidays, Exploring the Message of Hope in the Christmas Story. The book talks about how hope is vital to all of our lives, and it's often most prevalent during the season of Christmas. So my book speaks about the message of hope that we find in the Christmas story as we celebrate Jesus' birth. In the book, I explore the ways that we can experience hope for the holidays, as each chapter looks at different characters in the Christmas story and how they offer a message of hope to us in our own lives. Hope for the Holidays is now available on Amazon, and if you live in Athens, Tennessee, you can also pick it up at White Street Market. So I'd love for you to check it out and leave a review. Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483, in Eisleben, Germany, to his father Hans Luther and his mother Marguerite. The very next morning after Luther's birth, he was baptized on the feast day of St. Martin of Tours. His father was a copper miner, and his mother has been described as being a very hard-working woman. And apparently Luther had several brothers and sisters. Martin Luther was groomed from a very early age to go on to university to become a lawyer. This was his father's plan that was kind of forced upon him. But Luther had graduated and he was starting law school, but he realized that something wasn't right. On July 2nd, 1505, Luther was returning to university on horseback after a trip home. And on his journey, there came a huge storm. And this intense storm made him fear for his life. He got down on his knees, and he made a promise to God. If his life was spared, he would become a monk. Later, he told his father about this this experience, saying that he was terrified of death and divine judgment. And so he cried out, Help, St. Anna, I will become a monk. His life was spared, and to his father's outrage, he had become a monk at an Augustinian monastery. Luther gave his life over to a God that he thought was wrathful and hateful. Luther would punish himself for his sins. He starved himself. He would beat himself. He would often sleep outside in the cold as a way to punish himself. From a very early age, Martin Luther struggled with with this idea of sinner versus saint. Many people at the time believed that they would get into heaven. They believed that their good outweighed their bad. They believed that they could earn their reward to go to heaven. And this was not the case for Luther. He never believed that anyone could be good enough for God. His conscience convicted him as a sinner. He would constantly go to the local priest for confession. He would go on for hours and hours because he feared that if he didn't confess every little sin that he would would never be forgiven. He would spend hours confessing, leave, then return because he had forgotten something. And, And at one point, the priest even told him to leave and come back when he had actually something worth confessing. 
but it was never enough. He, he realized that he was a wretched sinner and his good deeds could never save him. He still didn't feel saved. Luther, however, was brilliant. He studied a, a great deal. He flew through the ranks. After only two years, he was ordained and started celebrating the Mass. He felt the full weight of his sins on his shoulder, though. He, he still felt completely inadequate. In fact, Luther once said, Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I am speaking to the living, eternal, and the true God. Despite the guilt and fear that plagued Luther, he was still chosen by his fellow monks to travel to Rome. He expected the center of the church to, to be this place of righteousness, But when Luther arrived in Rome, he was horrified to see the sinfulness, the poverty, and the apathy of those living in such a so-called holy city. So he returned from Rome, not enlightened, not excited, not at ease with his faith, but with even more angst. The monks decided that they needed to keep Luther busy, so they arranged for him to get his doctorate and become a professor at the University of Wittenberg. And Luther protested, saying, It will be the death of me. His superior replied, Quite all right, God has plenty of work for clever men like you to do in heaven. (laughs) Well, in 1517, Johann Tetzel, a traveling monk, arrived in Wittenberg. And he was running this scheme against the town folk there. He began selling indulgences in exchange for money. He essentially said that if you buy this thing, this piece of paper called an indulgence, then this is a way to reduce the amount of punishment that you have to undergo for your sins. It may also reduce the time that you spend in purgatory. Now many of the townspeople fell into this trap and they took Tetzel up on his offer. It was essentially salvation for sale something that was going on all around the Catholic world. And this was rooted in the corruption of the Catholic Church in Rome. Pope Leo X began to update the buildings in Rome, but he was running out of money. And so indulgences were a way for the Pope to gain funds in order to build St. Peter's Basilica. Luther found out about this, and he was completely outraged. And he publicly spoke out against the selling of indulgences. Luther slowly was finally starting to understand the doctrine of justification by faith alone without good works. He started to realize that no one could earn their place in heaven, but this was a free gift that was given to us by God. And so Luther decided to write out 95 theses, 95 debate topics really, And he posted them on the church door there in Wittenberg. The church door was essentially the first Facebook page back then. People would go there to read and to see what was going on. The invention of the printing press had allowed Luther's grievances against the Catholic Church to transform him from a small-town German monk into a rock star. Within 10 days, only 10 days, Luther's 95 Theses had reached as far as Spain. He was really the first theologian that had mass media behind him. Because of his status, you couldn't really dismiss or get rid of Luther. Luther had publicly denounced the Pope and the selling of indulgences. He was now at odds as a Catholic monk with his very own church. Luther didn't want to break away from the Catholic Church. He didn't want to start a new denomination, but he simply wanted to reform the church that he was already a part of. In his sermons, he sought to reform the church and correct people's bad theology and beliefs. Well, Pope Leo heard about this, and he was outraged, and he wanted Luther to come to Rome to answer for his behavior. Luckily, Luther was protected by Prince Frederick the Wise. Um, If he had been sent to Rome, he probably would have been killed. So instead, he was questioned by a cardinal in Germany. Luther was asked to retract, to recant 
his statements where he condemned indulgences and spoke out against the Pope, but Luther refused. He continued to speak out against the Pope in very, very public ways. And in one of his writings, Luther says, You are murderers, traitors, liars, the very scum of all, the most evil people on earth. You are full of all the worst devils in hell, so full that you can do nothing but vomit and come out devils. That's actually uh, one of the cleaner things that he said about the leaders in the Catholic Church. But Luther argued that the Bible holds more authority than the Pope. And that doesn't really sound like a very strong statement or doesn't sound like that would be anything you know bad to say, but, but at the time it was a very, very radical thing to say. Luther also argued that priests, bishops, and popes were not superior to other people. Luther was leveling the playing field. At the time, church leaders held all the power. But Luther began to chip away at that and at this corrupt system. Luther strived to give power to the average, everyday peasant, the people. And during this time, Luther also began to find true meaning in Scripture. He was, he was truly able to find answers in Paul's writings, particularly his writings to the Romans. He finally realized that a person's faith cannot be earned by doing good deeds. Instead, grace is a free gift given by God to those who have faith in Jesus. And this understanding changed the trajectory of the church. It took us from focusing on what we could do to instead putting us in good standing with God. So Luther finally understands this teaching of good news. He finally understands that good works does not earn salvation, but Jesus died on the cross in order to pay the penalty of sin and death and offer this grace that we can all accept, that we don't have to to work to earn the grace. In fact, we can't earn the grace, but it is a gift that is given to us. Well, Pope Leo X pushed back and he tried to order Luther to disavow his writings again. He charged him with heresy, and Luther excommunicated himself from the Catholic Church. He left, and he made an appeal to the emperor um, Charles V in the city of Worms in Germany. Charles came to Worms and found that Luther had about 90% of Germany behind him. He had clear support from the masses. And in 1521, at the Diet of Worms, Luther was asked by the emperor to disavow his writings. Luther knew that if he did not comply, he might be killed. But in defiance, Luther said anyway, I will not and cannot recant of my works. It is neither safe nor right to go against one's conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Luther had infuriated Emperor Charles V, and Charles now wanted Luther dead. Luther had no army to shield him, but instead he was protected simply by popular support. Charles signed a decree condemning Luther, and Luther ran away. He went into hiding. He was now the most wanted man of his day. But in hiding, Luther translated the New Testament into the German language so that people could read the Bible for themselves. He translated the entire New Testament in only 11 weeks. Luther eventually did return from exile, and in 1525, Martin Luther married Katharina von Bora, a former nun who had abandoned the convent and taken refuge in Wittenberg. And together over the next several years, they had six children. Luther remained a hero to the people during his life, and from 1533 until his death in 1546, Luther served as the Dean of Theology at the University of Wittenberg. Luther also had a bit of a checkered past. It's worth mentioning that he struggled with depression, with fear, anxiety, insomnia, and arthritis. Many people think that this caused him to write some unsavory treaties. Um, Some of his writings contain very offensive, even racist language against several ethnicities, especially Jews and Muslims. In fact, Luther once wrote a treaty entitled, On the Jews and Their Lies. 
Um, so Luther certainly inhabited this this sinner persona as well. Um, he was he was not necessarily um, very saint like. He was very flawed, and yet we remember still the contributions that he made um, to the Protestant Reformation. He was very very flawed. Um, but we also wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Martin Luther. He, he formed the Protestant Church, and it was Luther's preface to the Romans that actually allowed John Wesley to have his Aldersgate experience, where he felt his heart strangely warmed. Wesley, much like Luther, struggled with his acceptance um, of free grace, this free gift that God gives us, just as Luther had. He thought that we had to work to earn our salvation, but it was Luther's words that sparked Wesley's spiritual awakening on the night of May 24th, 1738. So the hope is that, as we think of this story, our hearts can also be transformed as well. The hope is that our hearts can be strangely warmed. Luther brought forth a reformation of the church, and there's a reason that we're still talking about it over 500 years later. But this is not the end of the Reformation. I think there's, there's always a need for the church to be reformed. The church needs to find ways to, to reach out to others in love and grace. The church has to continue to go out and to make disciples. And we still need Reformation within our own lives. Some of us may still find ourselves in, in the trap, stuck in that trap that Luther and Wesley both found themselves in. Some of us might still be trying to earn our place in heaven. Some of us might still be trying to do enough and to be enough, but it's important for us to know that we can never do enough to earn our place in heaven. We only find that in our salvation through Christ. We remember those words, salvation by faith through grace, apart from good works. As Christ says in the Gospels, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. It's the Holy Spirit that moves and works within us to transform us into the people that God calls us to be. It's through the acceptance of God's grace that allows us to be justified in Jesus Christ. Nothing we do can save us. But it's only through the grace of God and faith through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. So may we go forth with a fire in our hearts and proclaim the good news that Christ saves. And may we accept the truth for our lives as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, I hope you might consider heading on over to iTunes to subscribe rate and leave a review of the show. It is very much appreciated. And until next time, stay methodical.